Hello, my name is Claire Harrison. I'm a haematologist at Guys and St Thomas's Hospitals in London, UK. Today, I want to speak to you about long-term data from the PERSIST-1 study. The PERSIST-1 study was a phase three study involving patients with myelofibrosis randomized in a two-to-one fashion between pacritinib and best available therapies, which must exclude ruxolitinib. Patients eligible for this study should have intermediate one risk or above myelofibrosis regardless of driver mutation. And importantly, unlike other studies of JAK inhibitors, there was no exclusion for lower level of platelet count. Patients were stratified at the time of randomization according to baseline platelet count with particular attention to those patients who had extremely low platelet counts, i.e. less than 50 or 100,000. The primary endpoints are as shown on this slide and involve a 35% reduction in spleen volume, which has become a very familiar primary endpoint in this field. And the secondary endpoint was patients with a 50% reduction in the total symptom score from baseline to week 24 using the MPN symptom assessment form. The results of this phase one study were positive. And in November 2015, CTI Biopharma announced the initiation of a rolling new drug application to the Food and Drugs Administration for pacritinib. However, unfortunately, in February of this year, studies with pacritinib were put onto full clinical hold because of main areas of concern being bleeding, particularly epistaxis and intracranial hemorrhage, cardiac failure, and atrial fibrillation. And on the basis of this, a new drug application has been withdrawn. However, the investigators in the PERSIST studies, and there was a second study uh, which is currently being analyzed, have continued to collect data for patients in this trial as they believe the data is important and we hope that it might be possible for the clinical hold to be lifted. So let's have a look at the 48 and 72 week data from this study. In terms of the primary endpoint, 35% reduction in spleen volume, here you can see the data at weeks 24, 36, 48, and 72. And the data is shown for patients according to whether they were treated with pacritinib or best available therapy. And then the green lines represent patients who received pacritinib after crossing over from the best available therapy arm of the study. So you can see here that pacritinib was more effective than best available therapy and continued to be effective throughout 72 weeks of follow-up. And moreover, the patients who crossed to receive pacritinib from the best available therapy arm also had good responses in terms of spleen volume. Here you can see the secondary endpoint, the 50% reduction in total symptom score in a great degree of granularity up to week 48. And effectively, the take-home message from this slide is uh, ongoing benefit in terms of symptom reduction for patients treated with pacritinib. An important aspect of beneficial response to pacritinib for patients with myelofibrosis, who may often have cytopenia as a feature of their disease, is the agent's apparent lack of myelosuppression. And on this slide, you can see the hemoglobin and platelet count for patients treated with pacritinib, stratified according to their starting platelet count. The blue line represents patients with the lowest platelet counts, and the gray line, those patients with a platelet count less than 100. What you can immediately appreciate here is that these patients' hemoglobin nor platelet count dropped appreciably during the study. In addition, we can see this data paralleled and expanded a little more when we consider patients who were red cell transfusion dependent at the time of study entry. So here you can see the pacritinib and best available therapy arms compared, and the mean change from baseline in red cell transfusions uh, reduced only for patients treated with pacritinib, whereas for patients treated with best available therapy, this increased steadily during the course of the study.
What about survival data for patients in the PERSIST-1 study? Well, here you can see uh, four Kaplan-Meier plots for patients in the study up to week 132, with um, patients treated with percritinib in blue, patients allocated best available therapy in gray, patients from this arm who crossed over to receive percritinib in green, and then faring worse, the patients who received best available therapy and did not cross to receive percritinib. You can see that uh, the survival difference was not significantly different across these um, plots. Let's have a look at the intent to treat uh, analysis of survival. On the left, you can see the data at week 24, and on the right, at the furthest time point in the study to date, week 72, and again, you can see no significant difference looking at the survival in this analysis. What about causes of death? Here you can see um, data presented at ASCO in 2016 for all causes of death um, on study, particularly focusing upon these troublesome events that led to the FDA putting this drug on a clinical hold. You can see there was no major difference in cardiac adverse events until you see patients um, who stayed on the best available therapy arm. There was one patient, but representing 6% of the total, as the total number is relatively low, um, therefore probably no significant difference across this, these different groups of patients. And the same data really also for death due to bleeding adverse events. It's important to note that this study recruited a relatively high-risk cohort of patients as reflected in the total number of deaths uh, for the percritinib-treated patients and the best available therapy-treated patients. In conclusion, longer-term follow-up from the PERSIST-1 study, a phase three study assessing the benefit of percritinib versus standard therapies in myelofibrosis, demonstrated ongoing significant reduction of spleen volume regardless of the patient's baseline platelet count. In particular, there is a significant treatment effect of this agent for the highest risk subset of patients who are often most difficult to treat, those being the ones with a very low baseline platelet count. Procritinib led to significant reduction in total symptom score and had limited hematological toxicities, and we've seen the data now out to 72 weeks. Frequent low-grade gastrointestinal toxicities were also reported at week 48 and 72, although we haven't shown you the data in this presentation. We analyzed in detail overall survival but showed no clear indication of benefit or detriment with percritinib. At the present time, this agent remains on clinical hold but surely has significant potential benefit for our patients. Thank you for listening to this presentation today.